heart one meningitis. So meningitis can be of two types. Uh, it can be either bacterial or it can be viral. Uh, a diagnosis of bacterial or viral meningitis is uh, a clinical diagnosis based on patient symptoms and laboratory findings, analysis of CSF, both can look basically identical by imaging. So in cases of uncomplicated meningitis, the imaging findings are gonna be very nonspecific and they are really not going to help in the management of the patient. The most common findings are PL enhancement, high signal on flare images, uh, and as I said before, these are not really helpful in determining uh, the adequate treatment for the patients. So we do reserve imaging for those patients that have complications and hydrocephalus tends to be the most common complication. Obviously in very young children in the enlarging head circumference is generally an indication of hydrocephalus. In adults, we are going to need some type of imaging study to exclude that possibility. So having said that uh, imaging is not needed in patients that have uncomplicated meningitis, I do want to show you what those, uh, those images look like. And here on the left hand of the slide, you see some uh, gadolinium enhancement on the peel surfaces of the brain. On the center portion of the slide, and the right hand of the slide, you see some high signal intensity in the peripheral CSF containing spaces in the cisterns which is due to increased proteins within the cerebral spinal fluid. But notice that the fluid within the ventricular system remains of normal signal intensity. If you have a patient with meningitis that has abnormal signal intensity of fluid in the ventricles, you need to consider the possibility of ventriculitis, which is a devastating complication of meningitis. Here we have a case of viral meningitis, and notice that the imaging findings are basically identical to the imaging findings that we saw on the prior, previous slide with bacterial meningitis. You can see again that the flare images on the left hand and center portion of the slide only show some high signal intensity in the CSF, and the gadolinium uh, image on the uh, right hand of the slide that only shows some enhancement on the surfaces of the brain. Again, nothing specific about them. However, one needs to uh, remember that all that we see as high signal intensity in the CSF and flare images is not infection. There can be many, many causes for it, metastatic disease, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and artifacts. And let me show you a case of an artifact that was read or misread by one of our residents at night. So this case happened a few years ago in 2007, and you can read the impression in the report conclusions, which say extensive abnormal increased signal intensity is seen throughout the cerebral space, suggestive of meningitis. Now on the first three flutter images, um, you can see the very high signal intensity in the CSF throughout the cortical soul site and the cisterns, but at the same time notice that the patient has high signal intensity inside the ventricular system, and this would be, as I said, somewhat unlikely on a patient that's not very, very sick. Another key that this is an artifact is the high signal intensity seen within the liquid contained within the uh, vitreous chamber of the eye. Uh, this, in the case of meningitis, should never be bright, so these two findings ought to let, lead you to think that perhaps we're dealing some some kind of artifact. And indeed, uh, this patient, uh, uh, the sequence was not working well, so we brought him back the next day. And on the right hand of the slide, you can see the new image in which the CSF is uh, completely normal in signal intensity, and indeed the patient did not have meningitis. But because of our report, the patient had already been treated with antibiotics uh, for uh, meningitis. So beware of these uh, artifacts. What is the etiology of meningitis in the normal immune system? Uh, strep pneumonia is the most common pathogen uh, in children uh, and in people with immune system that's not normal. You find uh, other uh, etiologists uh, such as uh, E. coli and Klebsiella. Remember too that in children, uh, hemophilus influenza is a very common etiology of meningitis, 
and can lead to significant complications, especially the presence of subdural collections. So subdural collections uh, can be uh, sterile, which they are in the majority of cases. They can be large and hemispheric, but uh, anywhere from two to about 15% will become infected and will become subdural empyemas. With conventional imaging, even with gadolinium enhanced imaging, it is very difficult to tell a non-infected collection from a subdural empyema. They both have subtle increased signal intensity on T1, high signal intensity on T2, will demonstrate enhancement of the membranes peripherally and medially. The key in making the diagnosis of an infected collection are the diffusion-weighted images, and we're gonna see how they help us in a few minutes. Remember that once a subdural collection is infected, the patient is prone to develop other complications such as venous thrombosis, infarcts, cerebritis, and uh, intracerebral abscesses. So here we have a patient with sterile subdural collections. Notice on the uh, upper left-hand corner of the slide, the T2 shows the right-sided collection to be bright, uh, post gadolinium uh, There is enhancement, particularly peripheral, but notice on the right hand of the slide, you see the diffusion weighted imaging. The collection is black on the diffusion weighted image and is very bright, equally bright to CSF on the ADC map, implying that there's no restriction of motion and this is just fluid that is not infected within a subdural collection in a child that had hemophilus influenza uh, meningitis. Here is another fluid collection. You can see again on the T1-weighted post gadolinium image, there is enhancement of the peripheral and medial aspect uh, of the uh, collection. It is bright on the T2-weighted images, but it is very bright on the diffusion-weighted images, and it was very dark on the ADC map, indicating a restriction of fluid motion, which is commonly seen with pus. Remember that pus tends to be a very complex environment. There's a lot of cells, a lot of debris, and the bacteria that are found within the pus have uh, receptors for water on their surface and the water gets bound to these receptors and thus the water cannot move freely as it does in simple fluid. So we're gonna have restricted diffusion and restricted diffusion either in something that appears to be a ring enhancing lesion or a subdural or extraaxial collection in a patient that has symptoms of infection generally means the accumulation of pus. Here we have another collection, it's mostly in the midline, as you can see on the uh, T2-weighted image and the post gadolinium image. It extends a little bit into the medial aspect of the frontal lobe on the left, but both on the diffusion-weighted imaging and on the ADC map, you can see that it shows very restricted diffusion compatible with the subdural empyema. Not only that, I think that the diffusion-weighted imaging lets you appreciate that the parenchyma in the left anterior frontal lobe is involved and that there is an area of restricted diffusion within it which is an infarct as a complication of the underlying subdural empyema. Here we have another case. I'm not showing you the diffusion weighted images but on the right hand of the slide you see this complex multi-loculated enhancing collection along the base of the skull abutting the left cavernous sinus. Notice also that there is subtle enhancement along the sylvian fissure on the same side, and the patient has presented now with a hemiplegia, and on the diffusion weighted imaging in the central aspect of the slide, you can see a very large middle cerebral artery infarct. On the left hand of the slide on T2, you can see the swelling of the cortex and the increasing more intensity of the cortex suggesting cytotoxic edema when compared to the opposite side. So here's an example of a child that had a subdural empyema in the base of the skull that probably lead, uh, uh, led to an arteritis, and the arteritis uh, led uh, to the development of a middle cerebral artery uh, infarct. Now let's switch and talk about uh, intracerebral infections associated with meningitis, and those are abscesses which are more common in young males. Their mortality is very high, up to 20% despite treatment. Nearly all of them are pyogenic, and most of them are located in the frontal temporal regions of the brain. 
and you can see that they may arise from a hematogenous extension or they may arise as complication from paramenangeal foci such as sinusitis and mastoiditis. Now, the imaging findings of a cerebral infection will change according to the stage of that cerebral infection. In the first week, the imaging findings are going to be nonspecific, just an area of cerebritis, high T2 signal intensity, edema, there may be some patchy enhancement. In the second week, we're going to have an incomplete rim of enhancement. And in the third week, we're going to have a mature abscess, which is now a collection that has formed a complete rim of enhancement around it. The clues that this ring enhancing lesion is an abscess are the following. The rim is dark on T2. It is thicker where it abuts the gray matter because the gray matter has increased cerebral blood flow and blood volume. The central aspect of that abscess is going to be bright on diffusion weighted images and show restricted diffusion. And if you do spectroscopy, proton spectroscopy, you're going to find the presence of many amino acids which are related uh, to uh, metabolism, byproducts of the metabolism of the bacteria. So we almost never have the opportunity to see an abscess forming, but this is a patient that had bilateral frontal abscess. This is a complication of endoscopic sinonasal surgery. And you can see on the right hand of the slide, the cerebritis with a high T2 signal intensity and on the medial inferior aspect of the frontal lobes with no enhancement. And then three weeks later, you have this beautifully well-formed abscesses in those locations. You have this rim of enhancement. You have this peripheral rim that's dark on the T2, as you can see on the top right image on the slide. And then on the bottom right image of the slide, you should be able to see the ADC map from the diffusion weighted imaging showing you significantly restricted diffusion in the central aspect of these abscesses. And here is another abscess. You can again see starting from the right hand, the T2 weighted image, excuse me, from the left hand of the slide, the T2 weighted image with the very low signal intensity along the rim of the abscess. You can see the very smooth rim of enhancement. Notice that abscesses generally have no nodularity in the inner aspect of the uh, rim that enhances. You can see the very high signal intensity of diffusion, very black or restricted on the ADC. The perfusion map shows very little perfusion as it is expected in these abscesses. And the intraoperative view shows the corticectomy with a cavity inside of the brain containing pus. Now, Diffusion weighted imaging is also very helpful in those patients that have been operated. Notice on the top row of the slide, the preoperative imaging showing you the abscess with the typical findings that we have described. In the central aspect of the slide, the immediately postoperative imaging shows now a collapse of the cavity that's been drained. And now that cavity has been washed with an antibiotic laden solution. So you can see that the signal intensity of the diffusion weighted imaging which is the last one, the one on the right hand of the slide, is very high. That fluid is not a complex fluid and the water molecules are able to move within that cavity. But one week postoperative, this patient started developing signs of infection again. And you can see that on the ADC map, on the bottom right hand of the slide, the central cavity of that residual abscess is starting to show some restricted diffusion again, meaning that it is reaccumulating pus and this patient went to the OR and pus was demonstrated in this residual or recurrent abscess. Now, susceptibility weighted images can also help us to make a diagnosis. Here we have from an article that we published a few years ago uh, on uh, the uh, image uh, uh, label A, we have a couple of abscesses with a very smooth rim of enhancement. Notice that both on B, which is the T2-weighted image, and C, which is the susceptibility-weighted image, you're able to see two rims, a very dark external rim and a rim that is deep to that outer rim that is of a slightly higher signal intensity. This finding is typical of abscesses, neoplasias, and other ring enhancement lesions do not show it. And we believe that these findings are due to different hydration of the collagen that is forming along the capsule of the abscess. 
So here we have several examples. On the top row, you can see the gadolinium enhanced images. On the bottom row, you can see the ADC maps or the, or the uh, excuse me, diffusion weighted images. And in the middle, you can see the susceptibility weighted images. And if you pay close attention to the abscesses, you can see that in all of them, you will see a very thin outer rim that has very low signal intensity. And again, another thin inner rim that has somewhat increased signal intensity when compared to the outer ring. And as I said before, these findings are typical of bacterial abscesses.